Hi guys, welcome to Snake Snatters. It's been a long time since I've done a video on here. Um, I'm quite excited to get back into it again. Probably going to be a bit rusty. Uh, don't, don't expect too much from me. I've already tried doing first three or four minutes and this female was having none of it and completely putting me off. This is an Eastern Chain King Snake, Lampropeltis getula getula. This is the largest of the North American Kings and absolutely stunning. If handled regularly, they can become one of the most tame of snakes and you can work with them with ease. And they are just beautiful, smooth snakes. The, the, the way they feel is just sublime. There's no keel or roughness to their skin. Just incredibly smooth and just really, really great snakes to be around. Fantastic beginner species. We've been incredibly busy at the shop, as you can imagine, what with COVID-19. Where are you going? Trying to destroy my shop. <sighs> what with COVID-19, Paul retiring, and then taking on Becky and Pixie. It's been a busy time. Trying to keep up with everything has been a real challenge. Uh, and it's been not easy. So you're just going to have to forgive me for the length of time it's taken between episodes of this playlist. Um, but we're here now. That's all that matters. Let's rock and roll. And let's hope that this female doesn't cause any more mischief whilst I'm trying to make my video. Are you listening? Not even a little bit. Not even a little bit. I'm keeping hold of this bit. Let me get my notes. So, without further ado, welcome back to Snakes and Adders Introducing Series. This is episode 51, and today we're looking at the Eastern Chain King Snake. Scientific name, Lampropeltis gachula gachula. This is a species I've wanted to cover for a long time. This is the centre point to all the other North American king snakes we've covered so far. Historically, this was the nominate form for the Getula species, including many that have since been reclassified. The other North American king snakes were considered subspecies of this, and these included the Florida king snake, Lampropeltis getula floridana, Brooks king snake, Lampropeltis getula brooksi, Apalachicola king snake, Lampropeltis getula meansi, Eastern black king snake, Lampropeltis getula niger, Spe speckled king snake Lampropeltis getula holbrooki, desert king snake Lampropeltis getula splendida, Lam uh, Californian king snake Lampropeltis getula californiae, and Mexican black king snake uh, Lampropeltis getula nigritus. Are you holding on? I've got to flip the page. Are you holding on? Good girl. Many, many of keepers who have been in this hobby for a good few years still refer to these snakes in these terms but taxonomic review has led to many changes chief amongst these changes were led by pyron and burbrink in 2009 which recognized the group had three clusters the mexican black king snakes were synonymized with californian king snakes rather confusingly but they were and this was considered cluster one the desert speckled and eastern black king snakes were elevated to their own species status thus just thus dropping the getula part of their name uh, and this was cluster two and the florida and apalachicola king snakes were synonymized with the eastern chain king snake within lampropeltis getula this was cluster three what does this mean to you or me absolutely nothing this hobby is bred for type for 40 years or more and will continue to list apalachicola or blotched kings uh, as they are and given the horrifically high value of mexican black king snakes currently the breeders won't be keen to drop their name anytime soon either as a result the remainder of this video will be discussing the eastern chain king as it was described when the subspecies delineations mentioned at the beginning were in place this species was first described by carl linnaeus in 1766 as caluba getulus Caluba was a term used for nearly all snakes at the time and features heavily in many early scientific names. The term Getulus or Getula refers to the chain lighting pattern on the species' back, as you can see here, wherever you are, wherever you've gone, and was named after the Moroccan Getulian people whose tribal insignia, thank you, you're choking me then, whose tribal insignia bore a striking resemblance to the snake's chain link like markings. Are you reading it? Are you having a go? What do you think? It's 
crap in it. The species went through a number of changes before finding its way into the genus we currently recognise as its home, Lampropeltis, which means shiny or lustrous shield. Uh, from Lampro meaning shiny or lustrous and Peltis uh, meaning shield. Fitzinger created the genus in 1843. The first reference that I can find to Lampropeltis getula or getulus was Lampropeltis getulus stricticeps in 1942, which has since no longer been recognised. <sighs> the last recorded change so far is to have the name Lampropeltis getula getula confirmed by Gaia in 2018. This means there are subspecies Meansi and Floridana still recognised. As you can see, taxonomy is anything but an exact science, and just trying to explain this species past is enough to tie somebody in knots. So, just before I finish that bit, let's have a look at some of these resources I printed out behind me. And here we've got distribution maps of the previous subspecies as they were recognised. The bit we're interested in is this pinky colour, which is the Getula Getula. The purple is Floridana. You can't really see it, it kind of blends in together, but there is a green here. This represents the eastern black, which is uh, Niga. The blue represents uh, the speckled, which is Holbrookie. This checkered one is Desert, which is uh, Splendida. And then the, where are we? That's an integrated part, sorry. That is the Desert King. And this is the Western and Mexican subspecies, which would be California and Nigritus. So really quite a large swathe of overlap there. And these, these hash points uh, occur all the way along the range. Uh, so these, these snakes naturally integrate. As we can see, this is according to the ICUN red list. This is the current accepted total distribution of Getulus. But what they've also done is roll in Means Eye and Floridana into that range as well. So, da da where are we? So that's enough of that mess. Let's move on. Eastern Chain Kings hail, as one might have guessed, from the eastern and southeastern United States. It can be found in New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Louisiana, and northeastern Florida. On the boundaries of its recognized range, it readily interbreeds with its neighboring subspecies, Floridana, Meansy, Niger and Holbrookie. <coughs> this is not easy with a snake holding tight onto your hand. I hope you're listening. This is a highly adaptable species and can be found in a number of habitats. According to analysis by the ICUN Red List, forest, savanna, scrubland, grassland, inland waterlands, inland rocky outcrops are all suitable terrain. This species has an elevation ceiling of around 700 metres, so generally goes from sea level to 700 metres in elevation. Considered primarily terrestrial, they can usually be found within the vicinity of water sources. Eastern chain king snakes are the largest of the North American kings with a record length of 2.08 meters or 6 feet 9 inches and a weight just north of 2 kilos which is impressive for what is essentially such a slender snake to reach 2 kilos that would be an impressive sight in captivity this is this is in captivity sorry this is a particularly unneedy snake very adaptable to different setups and styles of heating. Chain kings have had a storied history of being kept with success by novice keepers in what would be termed in, in modern day very rudimentary kits. Because of the advancement movement, I will try and re make recommendations for what is considered best practice. But rest assured, particularly with younger animals, more rudimentary styles uh, can still result in success and more than likely you may even need to use them as you know even the most advanced keepers raise their babies in rack boxes or tubs just because it's easier and more expedient to do so we're not saying it's for life it's just while they're young a minimum suitable vivarium for a large specimen approximately five and a half feet like the one that i'm holding would be a 48 by 18 by 18 vivarium with a 48 by 24 by 24 being better and a 60 by 24 by 24 better still. Heating for me would be provided by a ceramic ball. I'd use a 250 watt variant coupled to a reliable day night thermostat. But there has been a pull away from these heaters with the recommendation to use halogens in their place. 
Whichever you choose, in truth, it is unlikely to result in problems. The thermostatic control is key to ensure that the animal can thermoregulate safely. Are you going to let me have my handbag? Thank you, please. Basking temperatures can be up to 32 degrees Celsius at the basking spot and areas uh, with areas to move away from that to cool down. The cool end is not of huge importance as this is a temperate and tough species. Anything above 20 degrees Celsius would be considered acceptable. Modern husbandry also dictates that UVB should be used within snake enclosures. Even though a sizable amount of D3 does come from the snake's diet, the UVB helps in other manners including the fighting of disease and ailments, basking and adventuring behaviours, and the deepening and, rich, and deepening and enriching of colours in the skin. Keepers using UVB often comment about the apparent increase in vitality that their snakes display. You can modulate the lit hours throughout the year to show changes in season, with summer days enjoying as much as 15 hours of light, and in winter this could be curtailed down to as little as 8 hours. King snakes eat other snakes, hence the prefix king, which we know from king cobra and king brown snake means they have a predilection for eating their own. As such, they should always be kept individually. The only time that they should be introduced is for breeding purposes. Both animals should be well fed at the time of introduction and breeding trials take place in spring after a winter cool down. The animals will be encouraged to have a period of dormancy at cooler temperatures. The males will produce sperm during this period, raising their fertility. The animals should not receive food during the period um, of being cooled down, and the length of this process should last a roughly a couple of months. King snakes will usually reproduce readily, and a gestation of around 50 days will take place for the females. Between 15 and 25 eggs will be laid in a suitable egg chamber we provide for the female and these will hatch with artificial incubation in around 60 days at an incubation temperature of 28 degrees celsius a mix of four parts vermiculite to one part water can be used as the incubation medium within the incubator chain king babies are large compared to their cousins and feeding is rarely if ever an issue they grow rapidly and calm down nicely with time King snakes on occasion can be very food orientated and may bite you thinking you were dinner. This behaviour usually improves once removed from the enclosure and the territorial element of those behaviours abates. Thankfully king snakes heads are small and their teeth tiny. They are lucky to draw more than a couple of specks of blood in most cases. For the most part this species is an absolute pleasure to keep and one could do far worse than have a chain king as a pet. So now I'm just going to quickly discuss their climate data, which I've worked out and printed for you and shown in graphs so that we can look at how we could manipulate this to better suit our captive snakes. So to that end, slide it across slightly. So I've only done the two graphs. The rainfall seemed relatively linear with only a slight peak in July, August and September. Um, but the daytime highs and nighttime lows are the parts that we're going to be most interested in. We've got these red hatched shaded areas. This shows the arbitrary limit of 10 degrees Celsius, which would be when feeding uh, and any uh, all hunting um, activity will cease. There's no benefit to it. And depending on where the animals are from in their natural range will incredibly affect how long these animals are forced to brumate for with northern range animals sorry southern range animals down near florida only potentially maybe having to spend maybe well they might not even brumate full stop but what they might end up doing is uh just slowing down maybe feeding slightly less and that period would only last about six or eight weeks and then they'd be straight back on it whereas if we think about the northern range we're hitting as low as minus three in certain regions, which will be New Jersey. And we could be looking at a period of maybe up to three and a half months, four months before they would reappear and re-engage in food. So to be honest, the animals that we keep are incredibly hardy. They breed with the minimum of manipulation. That is probably as a result of how many generations of captive breeding we've done with this species. So we don't necessarily need to go mad, but I would still definitely give them a period without food. I would allow them to cool right down, uh, maybe down to around 15 or 16 degrees Celsius. No food, couple of months. This allows the male to produce a good level of sperm. We will then 
give them raise them back up to full temperature good three or four feeds in quick succession get some weight on them make sure they're absolutely satisfied before they were introduced for breeding trials this is probably the only time that i'd recommend that you fed a male um, who comes out of this because with him being a snake eater we don't want him to be thinking with his stomach rather than any other part of his body so it's important that they're satisfied when it comes to food your peak temperatures throughout the year in the southern part of the range are going to be 32 to 33 degrees celsius and this is usually through July. So if I take the averages of the eight zones, we have from January to December, 12, 14, 18, 23, 27, 31, 32, 31, 28, 23, 18 and 14. So relatively mild and not too much of a problem. The nighttime lows is where there's a bit of a sticking point though. And this is where the activity would really drop off. January, so 1, 2, 6, 11. 15, 20, 22, 22, 18, 12, 7, and 3. The natural range uh, data points that I've used are Williamstown, New Jersey, Richmond, Virginia, Greensboro, North Carolina, Charlotte, North Carolina, Somerville, South Carolina, Greenville, South Carolina, Savannah, Georgia, and Jacksonville, Florida. We are going to be introducing our animals for breeding as soon as they emerge and they've had their first few meals. We're going to gestate for 50 days. They're going to lay their eggs. They're going to incubate for 60 days at the peak of the year. And then they have the remainder of the season, a good three or four months, to lay on as much weight in the wild as possible. If they don't lay on enough weight, they die. In captivity, however, they're such good feeders and so reliable that we end up putting a pile of weight on them early on and they grow like weeds. You can see just how well behaved she is. As much as I was taking the mickey out of her for trying to either strangle me or destroy my shop while I made my video. She's an absolute darling. What a pleasure to work with. These snakes are born a lot brighter as babies. With a lot more definition to their saddles. Which we can see here. But over time these diffuse away. And melanin starts to creep in and rob us of the definition. But this is true of many species. What we can see here is if I just slide this across so we can see it slightly more. This is the three species that Pyron and Burbank wanted to make synonymous with one another. Getula Getula, Floridana, which we still have the chain link effect. But there is a lot of yellowing, dotting and speckling in between the chain itself. And then finally, the Blotched King or uh, a parlor chicola king snake which is comes in every shade pattern and god knows what from stripes to blotches to a mix of both with reds yellows and speckles everywhere but no real chain to be seen at all and yet these are all supposedly synonymous and back together Gaia's reseparated them and put that back into its own getula getula meaning that these two exist once more thank christ Thank you ever so much for watching. I've enjoyed coming back. I know I've been a bit stilted and maybe not got my flow quite right. But after so long off, I mean, what do you expect? I'm going to keep working at it. There's a bunch of species that I want to work uh, work on. I'm hoping to try and do Angolan pythons. And really excitingly, I've got a friend who is going to bring in a Molendorf rat snake. So that I can do a species guide on that as well. Which I am absolutely stoked for. Make sure you subscribe to the channel on YouTube and give us a like on the Facebook business page and give us a nice hello and welcome to uh, Becky and Pixie who have joined the team who are going to hopefully help me find the time to make even more of these videos. Stay safe guys, big love to you all, peace.